So, um, without any further ado then, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker. He is John O'Neill, and he'll be speaking about Five Sigma uh, network events. Give him a round of applause. That work? Can anybody hear me? Good. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, there's one thing that everyone pretty much agrees on, um, and that is that networks are complex and no one really knows what's going on in them. Um, I, I actually have, um, our, the CTO at my company thinks that the internet as a whole was a bad idea. Um, but that's, you know, but, we, but while the internet is still going on, we, we still have a job to do. So what can we do? One of the problems is that there's a lot of information there. And uh, what we're really interested in finding are things that are strange, unusual or at least new and unexpected. And we want to be able to pick them out of the, of the unending stream of NetFlow and, and look at them. And if it's different, if it's unusual, it might be bad. Um, now, I'm going to use two words here, two concepts that are used in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people, a lot of different companies. But I'm going to use them in a particular way here just to clarify what's going on. Um, an outlier is something that is an improbable data point given the distribution you expect. Um, and, but a, an anomaly is a data point generated by a completely different distribution. And to bring this into focus, let me give you an example. On the left is Mr. Splanky. Mr. Splanky is my friend's pet hedgehog. Now, uh, if you, you, when you're just Mr. Splanky, the first thing I said was, what, you know, what an unusual pet to have, the pet hedgehog. Um, on the right is a space alien. If, if my friend had said, hi, this is my pet space alien, I would not have said, wow, that's an unusual pet to have. I would have said, what the bleep is wrong with you? What's going on here? Did I fall into the X-Files or what? Um, and that's the difference between an outlier and an anomaly. Now, there are a lot of tools, I'll, and most of you probably know them better than I do, that, that talk about finding anomalies and outliers. And I'm not, I'm not talking about them here. Um, I, I'm going to follow the, uh, 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 a long, time-tested philosophical idea, which is that if you want to actually get something right, do it yourself. And so that's what we're talking about here. Doing these, doing, uh, uh, trying to find outliers and then track down the anomalies and do it yourself. Um, it's, it's not that hard. And I hope we'll walk through some points and we'll see some, learn some stuff. Now, for this, I'll be doing this all in Python. Now, why Python? First, because almost everyone can understand Python. It's not difficult. It has surprisingly mature libraries for doing uh, data analysis, numerical programming, and things like that. And mostly they're written in C or Fortran, so they're fast. Um, it's easy to install, even if you don't have it already. And given the tools and given how we're writing this code, it's fast enough for what we want to do. We'll, we'll quantify exactly what fast enough means a little later in the talk. So, I'm going to you create a number of, there will be four different tools I'll talk about here to, to extract particular questions that I have about the net flows I'll be generating, the randomized net flows I'll be generating. And the, the, it's intended to answer some questions that, that at least I find interesting and, and to scale well. And they are also intended to be easy to modify and improve, which they could use improvement, and, um, and to play with. Um, and the, hopefully, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you can use them and make them better and use them for your own quest, to answer your own questions. And the code is available at the v GitHub repo on the screen. It'll also appear at the end of the talk, so if you don't have to take pictures of it right now, if you don't want to. Now, what's the, the basic problem? In, in a little more detail, I'm creating an unending stream of uh, anonymized net flows over, a lot, over machines and over time. And I want to be able to 
recognize the unusual thing that we're talking about. And it also has to be tunable because I don't want to actually have to do the same thing over and over again. But the problem with an infinite stream of NetFlow is that it's an infinite stream of NetFlow. You, you can't actually store it anywhere because eventually you'll run out of machine and disk and all that. So what can we do? Well, let's go at it this way. So based on this, the typical net flow of timestamp, source and, source and IP and port, destination IP and port, flow count, uh, create something that receives those, create tools that you can add to it. And each of the tools has two arguments. One is an update period, which is basically how often you check for weird things happening. And the other is uh, a number of standard deviation, which defines how weird do they have to be before, they tell you, before you're told about them. Now, just in case that anyone here is, is unfamiliar with bell curves, that's a bell curve. Um, this is a standard Gaussian or normal distribution. And uh, five sigmas there, you see, is, is one in a million. A five, a five sigma event is a one in a million event. 3.3 three sigmas is one in a thousand. So that gives you a, an idea of the scale we're talking about here. Um, and if you have, I know, more, not, if you're talking about, say, a, a billion net flows, a one in a million event happens a thousand times. So, you know, it's still, it's, it's, it's helping, but it's not making things perfect. Excuse me. Now, here are the four types of unusual information that I was interested in. Um, the first one is, does, is there an IP address that keeps scanning for open ports on all the other machines? Um, that would be something that I'd be interested in knowing. Is it keep going and keep looking for more and more ports on more and more machines? Another interesting question, well, I found interesting anyway, is, is there an IP address that suddenly gets a lot busier and that it starts talking to a lot more IP port combinations than it's ever been in the past. In other words, did it just spike activity? The third one, third question I wanted to answer was, is there an IP address that suddenly, that in the last time period, however you define it, got a lot busier than any other IP address in my network? And the fourth question I wanted to answer was, Shouldn't this, IP had st shouldn't this IP address have stopped doing interesting things by now? It's been there for a while. Why am I seeing new stuff from it? So some of the tools I'll use here, because I, I don't actually want to keep all the net flows around because there's an infinite number of them. I, don't, I want to use tools that don't require that I keep anything in memory. And so I'll use what are called sketching algorithms or sketching tools to keep track of interesting fast questions about the data even without keeping the data around at all. Now the first one is, is, some, is called hyperloglog. -log. Now I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Raise your hands if you have. Any of you? Very good. Um, basically what it does is it tells you the carton, if you're, if you're sitting on a set of things coming by, it tells you the cardinality of the set, the number of unique things you've seen, even if it doesn't remember what those things actually were. Um, so it's a very useful thing to have around for some of the questions I'm asking here. Another tool is that I'll be use, using an incremental, collecting incremental statistics on uh, normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, that's the mean incrementally calculating means and standard deviations over sets of numbers. And the final one, and the final tool I'll make a lot of use of is online linear regression, which we'll see more about in a little while. Um, and all this has the, uh, uh, the result of turning, of being able to turn big data into small data. I don't need to keep the, all the that flows around, I just need to keep the summaries around. Now there are a lot of other streaming algorithms. This is a sample of them. Um, they're all very interesting, and they all, it's kind of interesting, they all use the same sorts of tricks, but they're not really related to each other. Um, and they all answer their own specific questions. Anyway, uh, they're all interesting. You should uh, look them up if you're interested in this sort of thing.
Anyway, the first tool is the, what I call the IP port scan detector. And does, basically this answers the question, is there an IP address on my network that keeps scanning for new open ports? And it uses, it uses the hyperlog log and keeps the hyper, any, for each IP address, it has its own hyperlog log and keeps track of all the, IP, the counts of the IPs and IP addresses and ports its combination is scanned since the beginning of time, since whenever you started it. And at a, every time frame, at a certain, certain time, whatever time frame you set, five minutes, one hour, it'll check to see if that, it'll check to see against the cardinalities of all your IP addresses, whether there's some that are way too large. And it does that by using this, basically this snippet of Python code. Um, you get the standard deviation, the standard devi during the standard deviation for the cardinality of, of, over all your IP addresses. And then basically look for any of them that are more than uh, argument size, the argument number of sig sig standard deviations over the norm, over the mean. And if he does, it warns you about them. Um, Actually, I'll take this opportunity, if you don't mind. Oh, where is that? There we go. Go over to that. And I'm going to, oh, of course, it's not right. there we go. And I'm going to start the demo. Let's go, go back to, oh, sorry about that. So, um, now for this, for, for the IP port scan detector, it uses, uh, uh, the upper log log is most of the memory size, and it uses about 5K per IP address. Now, with 1,000 hosts, that's five megabytes. And it, once you allocate it, it never grows. You're, it's a fixed size, which means that we're not really that, it's not really that big a memory footprint on modern machines. And in fact, we could get a lot more machines, a lot more hosts, a lot more IP addresses to look at before we were really um, worried about uh, memory footprint. That's good. Now we also have the second tool, which is the uh, growth detector. Now, does this IP address suddenly get busier than it's, than it's ever been before in the past? And for this, we simply have, um, we have the hyperlog off again. Uh, that's getting, getting familiar to you. And uh, it counts the number of IP addresses that's seen since forever. And and then we, um, we keep the, we, for, each, um, for, each, uh, for each IP address, we also have a, one of the online statistics, the mean and standard deviation calculators, which uses very little, which has a very small footprint too. And basically, at every time period, we, up to, we get the new set of, of total cardinality, the total number of IP ports, IP port combinations that's seen for every IP address, and add it to its, um, to its online statistics. And then, and then we check, having done that, we check to see if there are any outliers. And again, uh, this is the code. It's really, again, this is basically, it's what it immediately says there. Um, the third one is the, the third tool is the explosion detector. And that's the, is, the, is an IP address suddenly get a lot busier than any other IP addresses? What we do here is we actually have the hyperlog log. We look for, we zero right out every time period. We get the new IP port addresses and then we look for use standard deviation again over all the addresses to find out if anyone has popped up as being much, much larger than any others for that time period. And again, very simple code. And finally, oh, this five, fourth point is host stabilization. Is there, is, are, is there a host that should have frozen by now, should have stopped doing new things by now, but hasn't? And what I'm assuming here is, a, is basically an exponential decay in how, when a, a host does new things, that over time you start seeing all the things it should do, and eventually you'll have seen, you'll have seen all of them. Um, now, of course, at any given point, we know how many we've seen, but not how many there will be. We can't necessarily know that, but given that, given the observations we made, given the number of IP port addresses we've seen it talk to, and given that we expect an exponential decay function, can we predict the eventual total number? And it turns out that after a little bit of calculus, we can. 
and then we can guess the, the remaining number, which is approximately equal to the, we expect it to be equal to the uh, negative of the slope times the average of each time period, the number we've seen. Now, there are some interesting factors in this. Uh, the first one is that um, hosts freeze. We, start, we, we get to the point where they, we don't expect to see anything new from them. And of course, they can unfreeze if we actually do see something new from them. Um, and of course, they can also never freeze in the first place. And that really means we're in a situation where the model's not a good fit for that machine. It might be a user machine and they keep doing new things despite our best efforts. And, but we can detect that in practice because the, 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 um, the number of remaining uh, uh, you know, uh, destinations would in fact clearly not get closer to zero. So we can kind of find that when we need to. And then we, this is the, the question we want to answer. And then it looks that we use, we use of course, the, the hyperlog log to keep track of the number of unique IP port combinations and IP addresses COC2. We also keep the statistics on it to get, the, to, get the, um, to get the average over each, for each time period of how many it's communicated with. And we get the slope. We have a linear regression to do the slope. And so we have this code, and that answers the question, um, how many would we expect to see? And then it tells us if it's frozen and if it unfreezes. And let's go over to demo time. So, so can, is this big enough to read or? Okay, great. How's that? Better? How's that? Better? Okay, I'll stick with this. Um, so we um, import everything, uh, set up the, uh, create the NetFlow detector, the, 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 uh, the container, add the detectors to it, and run, and start running 10 million, we did 10 million NetFlows. I just uh, decided that was a good number because it runs pretty quickly. Um, and so we see uh, things becoming frozen, growth scanner, uh, some interesting failures in, uh, in, uh, in, the, um, in freezing. And then we get to the bottom, this is a fair amount of logging. And we get to the bottom, it took, to do 10 million, it took two minutes and 13 seconds. Um, and then at the end of everything, we, we collect what's, what we know, which is that we see one, one machine that's currently looking like it's doing port scanning. Uh, nothing that's undergoing a lot of growth right now. A few might have been the, might have in the past. Um, one thing that's currently exploding, and one previous, and then a fair number of hosts that are unfrozen that were frozen in the past, and a fair number that are also that are frozen. And we can also look at do some plotting, so we can look at the uh, the IP port scanner cardinalities. So we see um, a lot of machines that have a very small number and then some machines that are, um, you know, a, a lot of, uh, one machine at least, that has a lot of IP4 accommodations it's scanned. And we see the same sort of thing. This is the, um, for the growth detector, the uh, means and standard deviations. We see, uh, again, there's, most are very small, but there are some that are much larger. Um, and the same thing with, uh, uh, um, others. They'll basically have the same shape. And so now back to the slide where. Okay, so can get there, I guess. Now, one question comes up actually at this point. Now, first I want to talk about the demo properties. Um, it does about 4.6 million net flows a minute. Um, I did, I ran it, at one point I ran it with uh, over a billion net flows. It took three hours and 38 minutes and 24 seconds, which is a little long for a talk. But <laughs> It did them all, it never allocated more memory. Um, so, and, it, and that's almost approximately the same speed as anything else. Um, the memory also stabilized very early on and never increased. So, that's good. Now, one question that I had was, in fact, is, is the district, we, we kind of assumed a Gaussian, a normal probability model for these numbers, but is that in fact true? 
Um, there's a lot, there's a, been a lot of press about various kinds of long tail and fat tail distributions. And so how do we, what we, if we actually wanna know, is, is this actually, is, is the Gaussian distribution a good model for this? How do we go about that? Well, there are actually, statistics has a lot of, of, of um, solutions for you there. Um, uh, Chi-squared, student T, um, Kol Kolmogorov Smirnoff, which the cool kids use, and they're all complicated. And I, I'm not good enough statistics, I'm not sure I can understand them on the fly well enough to talk about them. However, the, if, as long as you actually don't mind doing some code, there's an easier thing you can do that answers your question, and it's called cross-validation. Now, I was in, along, as, as in, in addition to normal Gaussian distribution, I was gonna try, try, try three others. Power laws, which have gotten a lot of press. Um, uh, the parameters alpha with the power, how are they? Uh, log normal distributions, which is basically a, assuming that the, the logarithms of the, of the data fall into a, a, a bell curve. And then a Poisson distribution, which is especially, is usually used for, for count data, which is basically what I've got here. Now, there are a lot of, there are a lot of probability distributions, and it gets kind of complicated after this, given um, practicalities. Um, but, um, so let's try them. And we're gonna go back to our demo, back to the demo here, and look. Now, so we have the four, we have the four, we have the four probability distributions, which I just mentioned. And they have, they each have parameters. We fit the param, we take, we take half, we, this is what, we, so they each have parameters we wanna fit. I mean, we wanna fit the parameters. Now what we do, and this is the code for doing that, um, and then we also have the code for doing the cross-validation. Now what is cross-validation? Cross-validation basically is when you split the data up into parts. You train, and you take each part in turn, and so you have one part for testing, and you use the rest of the, of the data for training, creating the parameters and use the held out portion for testing the parameters, the quality of the parameters given a probability set, you can actually then say what the, um, uh, you know, the sum of the, lo the, prob the logarithms of the probabilities for each point is. And so you can get an overall number of how likely or unlikely the held out data was given the, given the model you created from the training data. And you repeat that for every held out piece of data so you eventually work over the entire set. Um, and here's the point, though. Usually we take the negative of them, so we have positive numbers instead of negative numbers. Since the, negative, since the logarithm of a, of a probability is going to be a negative number. And so if we want to, here's the point. If we want to maximize the likelihood of the test data, we want to actually find the smallest negative log likelihood we can find. Um, so that's the cross-validation code. We did... Um, for each of the um, distributions, we, we trained on it and then tested it for, um, for various things we measured. And here's the, so we have the, we, the, the numbers here are, if you think of there, each of the, the average prob log probability, negative log probability for the test data given training on the training data. Now for, for the Gaussian distribution, that's about five, which is, well, you think of it in terms of, um, of, the, uh, of a distance in probability space, it's kind of not a very good fit. Whereas the, the best we did was the log normal distribution, which is a much smaller number. And in fact, we look down all of these and we see log, the log normal distribution is the winner for all of them. Now, it turns out that for some of the data, power law is such a spectacularly bad distribution to choose because of the nature of the data that, it, that the code just threw up its hands and said, sorry, this is ridiculous. Um, and I'm actually surprised at that because before I didn't run that, but anyway, never mind. Um, but for almost all of these, the log normal is the, is the best distribution to choose. And let's go back to the slides. The downside of this is that I'm talking very fast. The upside is you get to lunch quicker. Is that okay with you guys? <laughs> okay, I thought so. So, log normal distributions. Um, it's not actually that surprising. 
um, because they're of the log knowledge distribution, has anyone, now this is where if there are any mathematicians or statisticians in the audience, they'll start training their weapons on me. Um, but um, has anyone here been introduced to the central limit theorem? Okay, some, good. Anyway, the point is, is that log normal distributions, so the central limit theorem, and this is where the people, people mathematicians start shooting at me, is basically the statement that if you take a lot of random distributions and, and add them up, what the, the distribution you get is a Gaussian bell curve. Now, it turns out that, of course, the law, it's not surprising that a log normal distribution would have that would have a multiplicative version of that. I mean, it's given, it's simply multiplying random things together instead of adding them. And so it's not surprising that this is a good fit for our data. Also because there's lots of things that have a very good fit for using log normal data. And I just, I went to Wikipedia and just picked up some of the cooler ones and just wrote, put them on the side. But there are a lot more. Um, human, one of the funniest ones was the, the amount of time people spend writing comments um, on, on Facebook, writing things on Facebook, is distributed log normally. Um, the sizes of downloadable audio and video files on, online, log normal distribution. The income distribution, if you look at American income distribution, log normal distribution for like 99% of it. Um, rich people have their own distribution as it turns out, who'd have thought? <laughs> um, so, conclusions. Um, we want to do some, do some analysis of data, statistically, without having to go through a lot of really agonizing pain. And largely speaking, we succeeded. Um, Python data science tools are nice. They worked well for me. Um, we got some, got to see some cool sketching and screaming algorithms. Uh, there's an old quote by, um, by Alexander Pope that a little learning is a dangerous thing. Well, it turns out that a little statistics is even better. And, and but mind you, keep in mind, uh, the code's online, uh, and it can stand a lot of room. For, there's a lot of room for improvement. There are all, lots of questions you might have that are different than mine. Go for it. Be great. And uh, that's it. I, I'm, I'm really early. Um, that's the link to the code if you want it. And so I'm open for questions if you have any. And I have some sample questions for you if you want to answer questions but don't have one of your own. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Anybody? You. I took real NetFlow data and I anonymized it as much as I could. Um, and then I was basically, you know, just running through it, but, you know. Um, creating a model of it and analyzing it and then creating that flow and then sending it to, my, sending it to myself, really. Oh, and the question, I'm sorry, the question was, um, uh, was I, what kind of net flow, where was I getting the, I'm simplifying your question, I don't remember it exactly. Was I, where was I getting the net flows from? So, I'm sorry, continue. Would it still work if you had a Um, it would work, if, if the net flows were static, the question is would it work on, on static net flows? It certainly would. All you really need to do, I mean, what I would do, quite frankly, is write something that iterated over the net flows and sent them into the code. That's all you'd have to do. It's, a, that, it's pretty simple that way. Um, any more questions? Uh, yes, sir, you. Were your net flows or one to one? Oh, is the, were the net flows Um, as far, I, I, what I did was I took a, um, I took net flows from a long time period, um, which was pretty big, and then um, did a, um, did a number of, uh, basically I cleaned them up a bit, and then anim anonymized them, and, and then was able to use them to create, basically set up some code 
to be able to just generate an infinite stream of them based on that. Um, yes? Oh, that's an excellent question. And to be honest, it is, I could not actually answer it. I, I don't know what the dev collecting device actually did because, I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't know. I'll, I'll repeat your question, but okay, go on. Um, that's, that's a good question. How, if you have a billion net flows, I'm repeating the question. Um, if you have a billion net flows, you still have a thousand things to look at. Um, how does that, how does that, how you improve the spending of analysts um, time when you even still have a thousand things to look at? And I guess um, I would say three things. The first one is that um, going from a billion to a thousand is kind of a win. Um, secondly, um, you can certainly do other things once you have that thousand. Um, um, what I would, what's beyond the scope of what I did here would be to then for, do further analysis on of that. Because what you have there are things that are statistically unusual, but you might have a much better idea given your network, what would be the difference between an outlier and an anomaly? One th what's the difference between the pet hedgehog and the pet space alien? And be able to do maybe then bring expert, your own expertise to automate a lot of that away. Um, and the third one is there's, again, there's, there's a lot more work to do. We still have, uh, there's a whole kind of space of things uh, where you don't want to miss anything, but you also don't want to have to spend a lot of time, unless you have a lot of money to burn. You don't want to have a lot of, hire a lot of people to spend a lot of time chasing down every thing and, and really the balance of that is between of, of what your toler of your parano personal paranoia and your tolerance for at five sigmas it's one in a million if you have a, if you if you have a, a relatively low paranoia score you can put that up to eight or nine and have it we want in a trillion um, is that a good thing I don't know that depends on your paranoia but um, that's all I can say for that uh, yes you Yeah, I was lazy when I put that up. Um, I'll, um, but thank you, thank you for mentioning that because it, it will serve the, pub, the public embarrassment will serve you to actually write the how to, the, the actual read me there. Um, but thank you, thank you. That's good. That's a good point. Actually, yes. Um, uh, anybody else? Going once. Oh, you. Any, did I find any limitations in this, in this approach? Um, I think that there's, at, at one level, I was asking fairly, dis, fairly, fairly um, limited questions. So um, the, the biggest constraint I had was that there are probably um, corner cases in the code where I could have handled things better, where I just, I just didn't because it was code for a for talk. It was, I, was, I was exemplifying concepts I wanted to get across, not making the code really ready for deployment. Uh, and that's what you'd want to really, I think that's the biggest thing in my mind, if I was going to deploy this, um, you'd have to do a lot of things to make it, um, to do, have a lot more intelligence, but a little more intelligence about what it's doing and how to react to things and, and correct itself. Um, that's the biggest problem, I think, right now. So, um, anyway, uh, going once. Oh, uh, yes, you. Um, largely, I, I, I did that. It was, um, <laughs> this is embarrassing. Oh, yes. Uh, where is the, uh, when I ran it, then the, both the 10, 10 million went in about two minutes and took a billion, took about three and a, three and a third, three and two thirds hours. 
three, and qu three quarters hours. Where's the time bottleneck? It, it turns out that I'm spending about three quarters of my time generating, the, oh, maybe more than that, actually, generating the darn net flows. Because I'm actually just, you know, creating net flows and then sending them through. And a lot of the time I'm spent doing that. And I don't mean that to say my code's really great. It's just that that's part of this. I was timing the whole thing and I don't want to, really, didn't really, um, but that was about, that was, that was a lot of the time. Um, the, um, after that, almost all the time is spent um, adding things to the hyperlog log. Um, and that would be, since that's actually, that code is actually written in C, and I'm using a, a Python library with code written in C, that would be in practice, I mean, you could speed it up, but it would be, um, it would be a bit of, it would actually be work, which, let's face it, I mean, who wants to do work? Um, and that's, that's actually most of the time right there. Okay. Um, anyway, um, any more questions? How often do you how often should you repeat? How often do you re recycle the statistics? What's your time period, depending on when you, if you'd actually want to deploy this? And um, that depends on the tool, actually. And when I, I, in the examples I ran here, which um, I will show you, oh, find the right keys, there we go, and go back up to the top here. Um, it was actually, oh, that's long about where that, okay. If you look there, you see the numbers you see there are for the IP port scanner, I did it every 10 minutes, right? For the explosion detector, I did it once a day. For the growth detector, I did it once an hour. And for the stabilization detector, I did it once a day. 86,400 seconds. Um, those were, those numbers are best characterized as um, wild ass guesses. In the, that's, the te that's the scientific term. And I think that Although that, they, they, you'd want the two of them at different time periods because they, they measure different things. Uh, what the best one should be, I did almost no research on. And they might be very different than those numbers. And we'd be, be curious to find out, actually, but I just didn't do the work. Um, but that's, that's, those numbers struck me as being reasonably good for the problems at hand. Your minds may vary. Uh, yes? I would probably um, take the outputs from different runs and compare them. Um, and then, uh, you know, for, for a, especially if you have a certain amount of data where, probably take some data where you know there's um, a, a couple of things, maybe one or two things going we, that are weird, um, and you know what they are, and, and a lot of stuff that's not weird, run them in, with different parameters and see what you get. Um, and then uh, with different combinations, and then see if, see if one gets, the, gets what you want from your, from your test set. I, I mean, that's how I'd go about it. I mean, there, probably, there might be better ways. That's how I'd go about it. Um, any more questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. Thank you for coming to my talk. Have a good day.